Well, good morning to Pastor John at James River and to you here at Buford Road. God is good. All and all the time. So as fate would have it, three Baptist preachers out fishing together, not catching a thing. One of them becomes bored and says, look, fellas, since we're not catching anything, why don't we just take a moment and, well, let's just confess our secret sin to each other. Well, that gave pause to one of them, but the second Baptist preacher said, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Something heavy on my heart. I want to, you know, just get that off of my heart, so that'd be great. Well, the third one never would commit, but finally, after some coaxing, he said, all right, I'll join in. I'll confess my secret sin as well, but I want to go last. And they said, well, that's fine. So sure enough, the first uh, Baptist preacher said, well, yeah, I I need to confess that uh, uh, every Friday night I sneak into the town that's next uh, close by and I go to the bar and have a drink every Friday night. Well, the other two Baptist preachers just gasped. They just, they didn't say anything. It was just like they sucked in all the air, right? Couldn't believe that their fellow minister had done this. And so then it came time five or ten minutes later for the second uh, Baptist preacher to confess and he said, well, he dropped his head and he said, I, I can't believe I'm telling this, but for the last six years I have cheated the IRS on my tax returns. Uh, and I realize I've not given what is due to the IRS and I feel horrible about it. And the other two Baptist preachers again gasped, couldn't believe the depth of this secret sin of this second Baptist preacher. So a few minutes went by, not five, not ten, but a half hour, and the other two were beginning to get a little bit anxious. And so they said, well, come on, now you said you would confess your sin too. So, you know, what is your secret sin? Finally said, okay, all right, I didn't want to say this, but my secret sin is gossip, and I can't wait to get back to town. Yeah, well, I I wonder, I wonder if we took the opportunity this morning for you and I to confess our secret sin out loud, what sin would we confess? It gives me pause to think that every one of us listening at this moment has some secret sin that we're holding on to. We're nurturing, we're hiding it either because we're in denial of it or because our pride has maybe blinded us to it, although I I doubt it. We know that it's there. We have this secret sin that perhaps we're so guilty about, feeling about, we can't even begin to think about hearing ourselves articulate it, hearing those words come out of our mouth to own and confess our secret sin. So we even try to steer clear of having a conversation with God about it. Because we may think to ourselves childishly, well, if I, don't, if I don't bring it up to God, He won't know anything about it. Of course, we know better. But the reality of this is, because we have this secret sin that we're not confessing, we're not bringing before the Lord, we have a companion for life until we do. And that companion is known as shame. And that companion, shame, is very good at whispering in our ear, you're not worthy. You're not worthy. And so we're not only familiar with this companion known as shame, we're familiar with the messaging that comes out of that. And shame and regret go all the way back to the beginning. You remember in the Garden of Eden when they they messed up and they ate from the tree they shouldn't have? And you know what the Bible describes them as, naked and ashamed. So ashamed they had to run and sow fig leaves together to hide their embarrassment and their shame. And really, we've been sowing fig leaves ever since. To try to keep from God that secret sin that has stood as a barrier between the full reality of knowing God. And there's the good news for today is that God comes and chases after us with grace. That grace has always been about being present, about always seeking us, about always running after you, running after me. Even if we don't know it, you might even say, if we'll pay attention, we're on a collision course with grace. Now, when I say collision, you might think of something uh, busted or wrecked or broken, but I want to suggest to you on the positive side of that, how many beautiful images there are in the Gospels of collisions with grace. How many times do we look at the lives of those who were given to us, example in the Scripture, and you can see where this collision with grace took place and grace prevailed in their lives. And you and I have this same opportunity to bring whatever is busted or whatever is broken, whatever is wrecked in our life and experience this same kind of collision with grace. One example of this is in the Gospel of John. It's a familiar story. It's known under the title of the woman at the well. 
We understand these first four verses are really, uh, first three verses are really kind of innocent, but it's the fourth verse that I want to call to your attention today in the focal verse. But it leads up to us. It says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it wasn't Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and he went back once more to Galilee. Listen to verse 4. Now he had to go through Samaria. Now he had to go through Samaria. What, what does that mean? What, what is that? Okay, so were the disciples like they had his arm twisted up behind his back saying, Jesus, you have to go through Samaria. Had he checked his Waze app and there was some instruction on the road and like, no, 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 don't go that way, right? The line's red, go, go some other. Was that the only way to get to Galilee? Well, we understand through all, none of that is true. You, you remember well, the Jews and Samaritans had a feud that couldn't be beat, not even by the Hatfields and the McCoys. I mean, the, the depth of the hatred, the disrespect, the treating, not even like humanity between the Jews and Samaritans was so thick you could cut it with a knife. And in the midst of this, we know Jesus can't be forced into doing anything that he doesn't want to do. So what does it mean when it says he had to go through Samaria? Well, we understand from reading the rest of the story, he really kind of was, his, it was about his having to go, right? He had to go, he was having to go because there was this appointment that he needed to keep. Now, I, I do not know in the grand scheme of things before creation if God had preordained that time for Jesus to meet the woman at the well. I don't know any of that. But what I do know, it occurs to me that Jesus was informed enough in the beginning of this journey to know that he, he, he had to go through Samaria. I just got to go. Right in the midst of this. And apparently now we know on this side because there was an appointment for a collision with grace. And Jesus was chasing it down. Or should we say chasing her down. He arrives at the well outside the town of Sychar known as Jacob's Well later. It's at noon, high noon, the hottest part of the day. He sends the disciples into town to get food and a Samaritan woman approaches the well. And it's at this point that we understand in the story this is a bad woman. She's got a bad reputation, man. Everybody understands she's had a sinful past. And we begin to understand and put the story together in our head because she's coming out of town at noon to draw water, which nobody else did, that she had probably been rejected, she'd been ridiculed, she'd been persecuted, she'd been gossiped about to the point it was so painful she wouldn't even go to the public well in town. But what she doesn't know is she's ready for a head-on collision with grace at the well. So Jesus asks her for some water. Sounds reasonable, except it's not. He's a rabbi. Rabbi don't talk to women in public. He's a Jew. She's a Samaritan. They hated each other. And she's asking him. And so she's astounded that this Jewish man would ask her for water. And so she questions him about it. But if you notice in the story what Jesus does, he jumps straight to the point, straight to the heart of the story to deal with what's really going on with her. He begins to initiate a hard conversation with this woman at the well. And so he suggests to her, why don't you go back to town and bring your husband back? Uh-oh. Awkward. It says, I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, well, you're right. You're right when you say you have no husband. As a matter of fact, you've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. So what you've said is quite true. Talk about awkward. I mean, since the tension, can you at this moment... He's entered into a conversation with her. She has no idea she's on a collision course for grace here. But Jesus speaks the truth to her and the reality that her life is a mess. It's broken. It's wrecked. It needs help. And it's on a collision course for grace. You remember what I said last week? Jesus never made anybody feel better about their sin. And he doesn't make her feel any better either. He states the reality. He states the truth. But wait for it. Here comes the collision that she doesn't know. What he is doing is he confronting her, basically saying, listen, the well, the well of relationships that you've been drawing from in the past and you're still drawing from today is not going to quench your thirst. What you've been searching for and what you think you have found, not once, not twice, not, not five times, and now not even with the man who's married, is not going to quench your thirst. You need more. Listen, this is hard stuff. You talk about this painfully awkward moment. 
But as we learned last week, before we can collide with the grace of God, you and I have to collide first with the truth of our own sin, the truth of our secret sin, no longer hiding that. If Jesus were physically here, and I believe He is in spirit, I wonder which hard truth would He say to us? Because He's not here to make us feel good about it. He's here to present this reality that you and I need to be set free because of this this broken, wrecked mess we've gotten ourselves into. Would he he say to us, hey, you know, your your harsh anger and your temper is driving everyone around you crazy and you're driving your family away from you. Would he say your drinking is completely out of control? You're hurting not only yourself, but you're hurting people around you. Would he say you're, you're diving into pornography all the time? You will never find the intimacy you are seeking with your spouse by doing that. Your need to be right is wrecking havoc in conversations and people can't even share their opinion with you. you you're giving your heart to that person and I need you to know that person is leading you away from me. What's the hard truth? Would he say your gossiping is full of assumptions? and made up stories that are, that are spreading false accusations about people. I mean, he could go on and on, couldn't he, until he named your secret sin or my secret sin. It's hard stuff when Jesus confronts our reality, but it's necessary for the collision to take place with grace. As a matter of fact, I want to suggest to you, here's what I think is happening today. Jesus is on his way to Richmond. But he had to go through Bonaire Baptist Church. That's what I think. You can say he's going anywhere you want to, but he had to go through Bonaire Baptist Church in this moment, in this time. Now here's the fear. Here's the danger. You and I can miss this collision with grace if we make any false assumptions regarding this offer, this collision with grace. And it may sound like this, Jesus, Jesus doesn't really want anything to do with me. His grace can't be big enough to, to, to cover me. I can't even think about coming out of this secret sin place and confessing this out loud to God. So we're making up a story. This, as a matter of fact, the woman at the well had probably experienced rejection like you and I could never write a book about. You think about all the persecution she had fallen under. Perhaps she thought that this too was just another, just another false hope. This is just a... Another man trying to give me something that he thinks will fulfill my life. And I I just, I'm not going to fall for it. But Jesus went out of his way. He had to go through Samaria to collide, to chase down this woman and collide her life with this grace opportunity. And if you're not careful, like we, or like her, we may end up trying to talk him out of it by having a theological debate. In other words, we'll talk religion. Because part of this story, the woman at the well tried to redirect this conversation that Jesus had just kind of highlighted her sin, talk about a harsh reality. In the midst of that, she tries to take it a different way when she says, Sir, the woman said, I can see you're a prophet. You know, our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you, you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Do you see what she's trying to do? She's trying to start a theological debate with the Son of God. Hello, anybody home? Have you ever tried that? Don't do it. It does not work out well. He wrote the story. He is the theology. So she's trying to redirect him. But don't we try to do this at times? Don't we try to hide behind religion? We try to think that the religion, the stuff we do, is faith. It's not. It's our personal relationship that is the faith. Anybody hear me? So we get caught up in our tradition, right? We get so caught up in the way things ought to be at church because if the candle's not lit, God can't be here. Uh, You know, we we make up all these rules. If we don't sing the doxology, Lord Jesus, come quickly. He's going to strike us down. I mean, sweet rivers of Jerusalem. Listen, if we miss the personal relationship, we will try to find our faith in the practice of the religion. And this gal was trying to do that, to redirect this thing. Listen, this happens on some Sunday mornings. I'll be at the door greeting people when they're leaving and we've had a worship service and somebody will come out and say, I have a question for you. And I'm just like, oh, please, dear Jesus, no. And the question has absolutely nothing to do with what we've just done in that hour, right? There may be a small tag on the end, like one word might be used that connects it to the sermon. And it's some question, I have no idea. And I may confess this to you, I don't care. I don't care. 
And so I'll often look at the per person and say, well, can I be honest with you? I don't know. I don't know the answer to your question. A and if I may, I want to share with you, it's not what I don't know that bothers me. It's what I do know that bothers me. Amen. Have a good day. <laughs> but I'll tell you what I think in the back of my mind. The person's trying to dodge what really happened in worship. I think there was a truth that got too close. You ever been there? Boy, I have. I think there's a truth that when it hits, it splits open our hearts and our minds and our souls and we've immediately got to run for cover. And so I'll tell you what, we'll just wrap this up in a theological question. Throw him completely off base so that he'll never even think that something's going on with me. Jesus didn't fall for the theological obstruction that she tried to place in his way. You look at what happened. In the midst of this, the woman said, I, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he'll explain everything to me. You ready for the collision? And Jesus says, I'm the one. I'm the one speaking to you. I am he. Now, you and I can't really get the fathom. We can't fathom the depth of this. This is the first time in Scripture that Jesus has voluntarily claimed his messiahship with anybody. And he chooses to tell a woman who were, they were not respected in that day, a Samaritan woman, a Samaritan woman who'd been married five times, a Samaritan woman who'd been married five times and living with one who's not her husband now. How's that for grace? How's that for grace? That's a collision with brokenness and a wrecked life that says, I don't care what you've done, my grace prevails. My grace prevails, and it will chase you down. I'm on a collision course, you see. And Jesus says, I'm on my way to Richmond, but I had to come through Bonaire. I had to come through Bonaire Baptist Church this morning for you, for me. And, and I get it, folks. Many of us live in this fear, and we, we, we have this companion called shame, and we, we drag around this, this sack of our sins of regrets of things we've done. And if we're not careful, we think the worst thing that could happen is that we'll be confronted with that sin. Somehow we'll get outed. Somehow the truth will come out. I want, to, I want to share with you this quote I found this week. It brought me to my knees. The worst thing that could happen is when you spend your life trying to outrun God because you think He's chasing you to collect what you owe when He's really chasing you to give you what you cannot afford. Grace. Grace. The worst thing we can do is live our life carrying this guilt and this shame with us everywhere. It gets heavy, folks. I know that. You know that. And the invitation today is that as Jesus is on His way to Richmond, He had to come through Bonaire Baptist Church. And so He's saying to you and to me today, confess this, get this secret sin out of your closet, and leave it on the altar today. Leave it here so that when you leave worship, you won't leave as you came. You will be made new by my grace. The story ends that way for the woman. It says, then leaving her water jar there at the well. You talk about a whole sermon. There's a whole sermon right there. Leaving her water jar. Leaving behind that which no longer matters. Because she understands that water there and the drawing of relationships from that well will never quench her thirst. She's found the real thing. She's found grace. She's found the Messiah. She found Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? That's a collision with grace. Says she went back to town. She told all the people, come see this man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And here it is. So the people came streaming out of the village to see him. Friends, may our lives collide with God's grace in this very moment at a well that we can draw from that belongs to Him. Only His grace will get us home. Leave it here today. Pray with me. Oh, our Father and our God, it's so hard your gospel can be so hard, it's so penetrating because it is full of truth. And you tell us, in knowing you, we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. But God, it hurts. It's shameful. It's regretful, God. And to even think about 
bringing that secret sin out of that closet where we've hidden it for so long and so painful. But, oh God, that our lives might collide with your grace today. If there's one who's listening, God, who's never invited you into their heart to be Lord and Savior of their life, this is their moment. For such a time as this, on your way to Richmond, you stopped in Bonaire Baptist Church. For such a time as this, for a far greater number of us who we've allowed our lives to collide with grace, but not all of it. And we've kept some things back from you, God. We confess those this morning. That in this moment we need to answer this question. What has God said to me in this hour of worship? And may he find us faithful as we respond. Amen and amen.